He spent 30 years behind bars for a crime he did not commit. Mr. Cornelius Dupree, how are you, sir? Oh, doing fine. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Your story is really incredible. Uh, you were released uh, back in 2010. So it's been uh, 11 years. You went behind bars back in 1970, uh, 1979. You were arrested when you were 19 years old. So I always start here, Mr. Dupree, before we get into what happened. Just tell me the, the young man that you were before all this happened to you. Well, uh, I was a young man uh, in search of my own identity at the time, uh, fresh out of high school. And, you know, and I was working numerous jobs, you know, uh, like I say, trying to find, you know, trying to find my way, I guess you could say. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was just, uh, it was just really shocking, you know, during the time all this happened. Uh, words can't, cannot, you know, express, uh, you know, how I felt. So if I have this right, let me make sure I have this right. This happens in Dallas, Texas. Uh, there is a, a robbery that happens and a rape. And you and somebody else and a, and a friend of yours, I believe, you randomly get stopped because they think you may look like the people that committed this crime. Then the, 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 the victims of the crime, they see you in a lineup and they say, that's him. Is, is that accurate? Pretty much. Uh, first of all, I, we were identified by photo, photograph. Uh, oh, photograph. It yes, it was by supposedly. Uh, wow. Allegedly, I guess I could say. Uh, but let me start here. Uh, my companion and I, which is his name is Anthony Massengill. Uh, this particular night, we were on our way to a party, a house party. Uh, this is 79. So back then, house party was a kind of common thing back then. And, oh, yeah. uh, and so we on our way to a house party. It was like a block or two away from where we lived. And we had to, you know, we were walking. And so we had to cross over some tracks to get to the location. So prior to us crossing the tracks to go, you know, on our way to the party, we see, uh, you know, three cars of, you know, squad cars. And they, at that point, you know, called us over and asked us where we were going and then pr proceed to, to frisk us, you know, to see if we had anything. And at this time, uh, you know, back then, marijuana was, you know, known thing. So we had a bag of marijuana and uh, he had a little, little pistol, a little Derringer pistol. And, uh, and at that point, you know, we was thinking that we was going to be arrested for the marijuana and the pistol. And uh, lo and behold, uh, after taking us down, they charged us with two counts of aggravated rape, two counts of aggravated robbery, which was, which was, you know, it was mind blowing to us, to us both. And you said you're identified via photos from, from the uh, victims. And I, I always, cause I do so many of these stories and it's, a lot of times, especially if it is late 70s, early 80s, they are identified by an eyewitness and an entire, somebody's entire life uh, depends on one eyewitness. But do you think that the victims really thought it was you and your companion? Or do you think that they, they knew they were lying? Honestly, I believe that they were coerced into uh, picking us out of the lineup uh, because to my knowledge, uh, we didn't fit the description. You know, uh, I was described as being 6'1 and light skin and I'm 5'9 and dark skin. And uh, so with, with and, and, and I, was, I was also told that the perpetrators was somewhere in the area trying to sell some, some type of meat coat. And, uh, and so I was, uh, you know, so it was said that the police went in this area and showing pictures, you know, of us and, and everyone said that, that those guys don't fit the description. So how we come up <laughs> guilty, I don't know. Were the victims white? Yes. They were white. And you had an all-white jury as well. That's correct. So 
you go behind bars again. You're 19 years old. You're arrested December 1st, 1979 at 19 years old. Uh, you're convicted June 25th, 1980. But tell me how you're feeling when you uh, first go behind bars as a teenager. Wow. I mean, it was like it was like night and day, you know, coming from what we call the free world society and uh and being placed in a cage like an animal uh you know having to adjust and relearn a whole different world it was uh it was uh it was very troubling i mean in 1979 and here in texas in prison uh it was uh, it was ran prison was ran by inmates, and me going in probably like one fifty five I think at that time, you know small guy small frame you know young guy, uh, being put in prison where, you know you have a, you know guys with you know murder cases and all different kind of cases and they were bigger guys and older guys and, you know and so having that much time at a young age, 75 years, I really didn't know if I was ever gonna get out alive. And so being placed in that environment, all I knew was I had to do whatever it took to survive. And uh, so it was very, very scary. Hmm. And so for folks who may not understand, because again, you know, we're listening to you and we're losing, we we're thinking logically, well, if the, if the person who did this was a tall, light-skinned dude, six one, uh, you're a five nine, dark-skinned dude. How in the world do they? Ma I mean, we know how the system works, but nonetheless, in this trial, how in the world do they manage to convict you of? I believe you're convicted of. Is it aggravated rape and robbery? No, I was convicted of aggravated robbery. The rape case was uh, was dismissed. It was thrown out. Right, because they figure they already could get enough time on you, so they they dismiss the robbery case, right? Well, that's kind of like how they put it, but mm -hmm. in terms of in my own terms, uh, you know, uh, they tried me for the uh, the robbery case because my companion had the pistol, the gun. They took the gun and used the gun as evidence in the robbery case in order to convict me. So that was the evidence. They knew that I actually didn't commit the crime. So it was right. no way in which they could convict me of the rape case. Of rape. So because, wow. these, so because both of these cases were together, you know, it was, the, it was like, it was the guy and his girlfriend. I would assume his girlfriend. They were together. So I'm supposed to rob the guy and rape the girl. And the girl was actually supposed to have been raped. They did a rape kit on her. But because I wasn't the actual perpetrator, they didn't have the evidence to convict me of the rape. So because we had the pistol, they used the gun as evidence in the robbery. And uh, that's how I was convicted. They charged me on with robbery, convicted me of robbery, dismissed the rape case. So they did whatever they could do. Knowing yes. you didn't do this, they did whatever yes. they could do. And and did did the did the uh, victim testify? Did 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 she point you out in the courtroom? Keep in mind, yes, she she pointed me out in reference to the robbery. Being, mm. Keep in mind, I'm being tried for robbery, not rape. Right. So they used the lady that was supposed to have been raped, they used her for an eyewitness in the robbery. Now, also, the guy in which I supposed to rob, they, he never testified that I was the one who robbed. Mm. It was his girlfriend that testified that I was the one who robbed. So Mr. Dupree, let me ask you this. So you are, uh, you're 19 years old, you're in this courtroom, you see white victims, a white jury. I know you're just a kid at this point, but are you thinking at this point in this trial, this is a rat, like this, they, they, they are gonna get me, or is your mind not even going there? Well, let, 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 me, let, let, me, let me point out that, uh, you know, growing up, you know, as a you know young kid and all, you know, I used to watch a lot of television, you know, TV, 
And uh, and one of my favorite shows was uh, Perry Mason. And, uh, you know, I really kind of liked the way Perry Mason, uh, you know, he always won his cases. And I think all his cases was based on true and, and, and correct evidence. I think that's, you know, I really thought that was the way the system worked, that you were actually uh, innocent to proven guilty. But being caught up in the system at that young age and uh, going through that trial, even though it was the white, white jury and, you know, my people wasn't allowed in the courtroom uh, and all that stuff was going on, I still, you know, felt in my heart and deep in my mind that you know, somehow or another they would find out that I'm not the actual perpetrator and I would be set free. But lo and behold, uh, that came to pass. And I had to deal with the reality of it is, and the reality of it is, you get that you're proven innocent. And you were sentenced to 75 years. How was your, how was your family affected by this? Wow, they, 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 were, they were really torn. Uh, you know, my mom at the time was, uh, you know, while I was in jail being, being arranged on the charges, you know, my mom was, you know, uh, considering getting an attorney and things like that, which would, you know, take, you know, our whole life savings. And, and, and you know, and I, you know, convinced my mom, mom, I hadn't, I hadn't done anything. They have the wrong people. They're going to let me go. And uh, so don't 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 use your money on no attorneys because attorneys don't give you no guarantees. They just they just take your money. And so because I felt I knew I was innocent and I felt that I was going to be, you know, be let go and, and the truth would prevail. Uh, you know, it really it really had a you know it, it really gave a, a hard blow to to my to my parents. Is your mother still with us? No, she uh, she died while I was in prison. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Sorry to hear Thank that. Uh, so, 30 years. I, I mean, I'm I'm 44. I, I I can't even imagine 30 years. How are you? The time. How are you getting by? How are you surviving? Uh, three decades behind bars. Uh, you mean after the fact? Right, right now. Yeah, I, 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 as you're in there, as you're in there, actually. Oh, uh, you know, uh, you know, why you're there, you know, you, you, you have to, uh, you have to gravitate to, uh, to a new lifestyle. You know, you have to do whatever you have to do. But most of all, you have to, uh, you have to be faithful. You have to be, have to find your faith, something that you truly believe in, to kind of help you along the way. And that's that that me personally, I you know that what brought me to Christ, you know, uh, being being a, a a religious person, you know, one who believe in in God, uh, you know, uh, I I just kept the faith, and and with that, I think is what brought me to this point, to where you know now I'm here faced with another chance, another shot at life, and life is much better. And I believe it's because of my faith in, in God. When you were behind bars, did you feel like you were coming across a lot of young men like yourself who were, who were wrongfully convicted, who were wrongfully behind bars? I want to say yes and no, because, and the reason I say that is, you know, you have people, uh, you know, and I'm gonna use myself. You know, I'm one who knew my truth. I knew I was innocent. I know I didn't commit a crime, and uh, and so I was constantly going to the writ room, law library. You know, stuttering and filing writs and, and things of that such. And so you find other other people who who want to take on the same claim, and you really don't know they truth or not. I mean, but it's so many. That's that's pretending, you know, well, I didn't do my, you know, I'm, I'm innocent as well. And I didn't, and so you really don't know, but, but I do believe that there's others in there. I just can't say to, to what degree you, you, you just, so you really kind of kind of stay to yourself and, you know, do your own thing and uh, not worry too much about other folks. 
you you said in the beginning that uh at that point in the early 80s when you first went in that prisons were really run by the by the inmates uh i i always heard and if i'm wrong correct me that in the early 80s that prison was much more violent back then it was it was much worse back then and it it, it got a little bit more strict as as time went on in the 90s would you agree with that is that accurate that 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 it changed at a certain point and or or no yes you hit it right on the head it changed tremendously i mean uh you know when i went in prison uh it was uh they had the cliche was only the strong survive and so you had to be one who was you know willing to kill if that be the case you know uh inmates having what they call shanks knives that was made out of you know various things in prison that was a common thing everyone had some type of protection and uh and, and to kill someone in prison was only a five-year sentence back then. Wow. I mean, you can get only five, you only get five years for, for killing another, another inmate. And prison was pretty much structured uh, like uh, military. You know, you had to get up early in the morning. You have to make your rack, you know, you, you had to clean your cell. I mean, you had to do all this here prior to going to work early in the morning. This is like five o'clock in the morning. You know, you had to get up like four o'clock to go eat breakfast if you're gonna go eat breakfast. Five o'clock, you had to make your rack and you go to the fields at six o'clock. And so it was from sun up to sundown. So to the fields, what, what, what are you doing in the fields in case folks may not understand that? Well, the fields is, I mean, I'm sure a lot of folks who watch the color purple, where they were picking cotton and things of that such. That's, you were, that's exactly. You were, cotton. you were picking cotton in prison. I picked cotton for five years in prison. Wow. Wow. That's, that's, that's wild. Wow. That's something. And I heard that's brutal work. It, it, it cuts your fingers. Uh, it's, I heard that's hard work. It's not a game. I mean, it's, it's, hard, it's hard labor. Yes, it really is. Uh, you know, if you want to, now just take me, for instance, me going down there at such a young age, 19 years old, and uh, like I say, I picked it for five years, so that's to about 24, 25. I was still young and had a strong back, so to say. You know, uh, you know, I was very athletic, playing basketball, I was lifting weights, things of that such. And so I always been, uh, uh, athletically inclined. So I was always doing something to kind of stay in some type of shape. Uh, but you had older guys who was coming to prison. They wasn't so fortunate, but they wouldn't treat them any different. They would send them to the fields. They would have to go to, the, I mean, this guy's my age, I'm, I'm 62 now. It was guys coming out there my age and older would have to pick the cotton as well. And it wasn't so so easy on them. Sun up to sundown. Are as you're picking cotton, are you thinking in your spirit like this this is slavery? I'm literally on a field in Texas picking cotton. Are you thinking that? Yes, exactly. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, it really uh, you know, your your mind really go to you know, reverting back to some of the old songs and the movies and, and, and the stories that in which you heard, you know, uh, early on. And now to be in, in the reality of it, you know, you picking cotton, you got, the, you got the guard on the horse with the shotgun and the pistol, all that was real. Mm. It, it was real and it was, uh, you know, but, you know, in the meantime, I mean, this is what you have to endure until, you know, until the, the change, you know, come about. So due to the work of the Innocence Project and due to the work of DNA, uh, you are you are freed and you're, you're one of the 
Were, are you the first person in Texas freed by uh, DNA evidence? Is that accurate? No, no. I'm the, uh, I think I'm the 44th uh, exonerate in the uh, state of Texas. So explain how you're free with DNA because some folks are thinking, well, how was their DNA back in 1979? So explain how you're freed with that. Wow. Thanks for asking. I mean, the, the story is so, it's so overwhelming. Uh, but, but keep in mind, when I was arrested back in 1980, uh, there was no such thing as DNA. I think it was only like a blood test. They was taking blood tests and things of that sort. So by them convicting me of the aggravated robbery and sentencing me 75 years, which is actually a life sentence, you know, anything 60 years and over is considered a life sentence. So I had 75 years. So uh, by them sentencing me 75 years in, in, in the Texas Department of Corrections uh, for that length of time, there's a strong possibility that I would have not made it. You know, and, and they knew that. You know, so with the dirty work in which they had uh, committed, they were looking at it by me having that sentence before I get out, I would probably die. So the world would never know what actually took place. But lo and behold, somewhere around 90, somewhere when the Innocent Project, uh, 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 let me put it this way, by me going to the law, lab, law library in the writ room and doing all the, the legal work, I, I, you know, I was, you know, corresponding and exchanging information with other inmates. And so this one guy came to me one day because he knew that I was working on my case and what it consisted of. He told me, have I heard about this, uh, this uh, uh, entity in New York called the Innocent Project? I said, no. So he, he said, well, this is an entity that would take your case pro bono, meaning that they'll take it free. And, uh, and uh, if you have, uh, if there's any evidence that can prove, you know, your innocence. And I didn't know if there was any evidence to prove my innocence. So I said, well, you know, I, I take the, the information and I write them and, uh, and see what, you know, what goes from that. So I wrote them a letter explaining to them that I was in prison for a robbery that I didn't commit. But in this robbery case that I, they say that I committed also consisted of a rape that they, they never uh, charged, I mean, they never uh, convicted me of, they dismissed me. And so I asked them that if, if, if they go back and do, uh, do a research on uh, the rape case, they're gonna find out that I didn't rape this lady. And if I didn't rape her, I didn't rob this guy. So that will, you know, that will uh, uh, exonerate me on the whole robbery. So this was around 90 something. So they went back and they, you know, they wrote to Dallas and they looked up my case and they, they went back and they found evidence. They found one pre recur wow. one pre recur where this lady was supposed to have been raped. And so they, 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 uh, uh, they requested the evidence and, uh, to the judge and finally got me a new trial. So with that one pre recur they did the test on it and the test shown that I wasn't the perpetrator who raped the lady. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm not the one who raped the lady, I didn't do the robbery because they were both together. And that's exactly why I'm here today. Wow, so you are finally released July 22nd, 2010, after 30 years, you are finally exonerated June 4th, 2011. Uh, thankfully, the state of texas did compensate you although you know there's no amount to really compensate uh taking away 30 years from from somebody uh it's been it's been 10 years since you've been out uh how, how have you been able to move forward and just i'm sure there's ptsd i'm sure it's a lot to get used to how have you been able to move forward well like you i know you've heard it before you know it's like one day at a time you know, you, uh, you know, uh, coming out of prison after being in for 30 years. And, uh, you know, I was accustomed to, you know, just holding money, spending money, but now they have debit cards and credit cards, and, 
you know, you know you, believe me, I mean, it's, and, and now the cell phones, I mean, I went in when there was push button and <laughs> dial phones and things of that such. I mean, it's so much that I had to relearn, well, have to learn, uh, you know. Uh, and so it, it, it's been challenging and it's like I say, one day at a time and, you know, now I know how to do Zoom. I mean, I'm, I'm on, <laughs> you know, it's, it's I mean, it's, it sound prehistoric, but uh, that, that's my reality. So, you know, yeah. and I did, I've been doing a lot of traveling uh, and, and things of that such. So I've been quite a few places, uh, you know, doing my time, of, you know, being being released. So uh, I, I take it all with stride and stride. Uh, I have no complaints. God make no mistakes, you mm. know. Uh, and so uh, here I am. And you're, you're 62? Yes, sir. Well, we're on the radio. Folks can't see you, but you, you look about 42. <laughs> you, you. Look so, you look so young. It's amazing. To, yeah, that's incredible. Uh, I, I'm, I think I know the answer to this, but did you ever hear uh, from the, the victims ever get an apology? Did they ever own anything? I'm assuming not, but I figured I'd Well, no, no. You, I mean, you just, man, it's like you already know the story in advance. Uh, but but right after I was released, uh, and I was uh, exonerated, you know the story got out. I mean I was it was all over the news, all over the radio. I mean it was everywhere. And uh, so the guy that was supposedly had gotten robbed, who who never identified me as the robber, he wrote my attorney. He well he called my attorney in New York. Uh, which is Nina Morrison. And he, 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 you know, he explained to her who he was. And he asked her, is there any way in which she could uh, get in contact with me because he wanted to, to apologize, oh. you know? And so uh, she said, she called me and, and told me about, you know, what was taking place and, uh, and asked me, is it okay if I, she gave him my number? And so I said, yes, that's fine. So she gave him the number, he contacted me and uh, he said, Mr. Dupree, I said, yes, sir. His name is, I won't reveal his name. And uh, he said, I just wanted to, uh, you know, apologize. He said, man, I thought you was out years ago. He said, I never knew that you were still in prison. He said, but I just wanted to let you know that I never told the cops that you were the one who robbed me. He said, and as far as my girlfriend, she and I from that night on, that you know, that all that took place, they departed because she felt like uh, during this altercation, uh, she was supposed to have been raped and he was telling me that he was bleeding like he didn't know what because he was pissed to work, you know, by these guys. I mean, and, and anyway, she held him a, a candle because she felt like he didn't protect her enough. And so he was saying since then they had just, you know, went apart. And so he was, you know, expressing his, you know, his, his, his uh, uh, you know, his feelings toward, you know, me being in prison all that while and losing my mom and all that stuff. And I said, well, that's great. And so I told him, I said, well, man, I really, I really do uh, 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 commend you for having, you know, the carriage to uh to want to call me and talk to me and and and, and, and offer me your, your you know your forgiveness and I say and, and because of that just because of that I believe you are sincere but I want to say I didn't do it just because he asked or he offered his forgiveness I did it because in order for me to move forward I have to let go so it wasn't for him, it was for me. And so I have no regrets. I have no ill feelings toward him whatsoever. And, and my life been, 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 you know, it's been blooming ever since. Wow. So thank you for asking that question. Oh, uh, listen, thank you for telling the story. It's just so important. Uh, what a story, what a story. And you're obviously a survivor and a warrior. Uh, one last thing, I, I know uh, as far as the Innocence Project, uh, you're on the advisory board 
um, and exoneration. Is, is, that, is that accurate? Yes, I'm on the Exoneri, uh, the Innocent Project Exoneri Advisory Board in New York City. I also, uh, I'm also a part of Exoneration Nation uh, in Oakland, California on the Ex Advisory Board. So I've been real active in, in terms of trying to help in any way I can uh, with, with the people that are being released and those who are still incarcerated. 